Let me mention it once again as we did this morning, since nobody came up to me afterwards to say, oh yes, I wanted one of those DVDs. The DVDs have arrived. A fantastic film, you know, we showed it on Independence Day Sunday in the evening, Anthem for a Nation. And on faith, I ordered copies based on the raising of your hands as to who wanted that. And uh, the producer has also sent us 10 copies, Walking by Faith, without charging me for them, on the basis of an offering that each one of you would give a donation for uh, the DVD that you take. I have four of them, or Blu-rays, that you, if you happen to have a Blu-ray player, you can uh, get one of those, or rather upgrade uh, from what we saw, which is only a DVD. But please do see me afterwards, because uh, I don't want to have to make him wait to be paid for the DVDs that he so graciously sent to us. See me afterwards, please. All right, please take your hymnals, your hymnals, your Bibles. <laughs> Music is on my mind today. All right, over to Acts chapter 28, the final message. It may last two weeks, but I'm gonna to try to finish it tonight. Government-supported ministry, we're in Acts chapter 28. I'm gonna start reading in verse 16, although we have already covered the first part of this passage but it helps us to understand what's taking place at the end. Acts chapter 28, beginning in verse 16. And when we came to Rome, the centurion delivered the prisoners to the captain of the guard, but Paul was suffered to dwell by himself with a soldier that kept him. And it came to pass that after three days, Paul called the chief of the Jews together, and when they were come together, he said unto them, Men and brethren, Though I have committed nothing against the people or customs of our fathers, yet was I delivered prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans, who, when they had examined me, would have let me go, because there was no cause of death in me. But when the Jews spake against it, I was constrained to appeal unto Caesar, not that I had ought to accuse my nation of. For this cause, therefore, have I called for you, to see you, and to speak with you, because that for the hope of Israel I am bound with this chain. And they said unto him, We neither received letters out of Judea concerning thee, neither any of the brethren of the king showed or spake any harm of thee. But we desire to hear of thee what thou thinkest, for as concerning this sect, we know that everywhere it is spoken against. And when they had appointed him a day, there came many to him into his lodging, to whom he expounded and testified the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus, both out of the law of Moses and out of the prophets, from morning till evening. And some believed the things which were spoken, and some believed not. And when they had agreed not among themselves, they departed. After that Paul had spoken one word, well spake the Holy Ghost by Isaiah the prophet unto our fathers, saying, Go unto this people and say, Hearing ye shall hear and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see and not perceive. For the heart of this people is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes have they closed lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and should be converted and I should heal them. Be it known therefore unto you that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles and that they will hear it. And when he had said these words, the Jews departed and had great reasoning among themselves. And Paul dwelt two whole years in his own hired house, and received all that came unto him, preaching the kingdom of God, and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ, with all confidence, no man forbidding him. Amen. Gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you that when you choose to open a door, you can open it very widely and in the most unexpected way and in the most unexpected places. You are God. You are sovereign. You have 
human beings and angelic beings as your servants. But it is not to angels, but to us, that the gospel of Christ has been committed. And you have given us a commission. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Father, how we thank you that you sent Paul, but you likewise give us through Paul and through his teachings the obligation that each one of us has to every day, in every way possible, proclaim the kingdom of God and the things concerning our Lord Jesus Christ. Help us, like Paul, to do it with all confidence, knowing that when you want to open the door, no man can close it. You declare that in the book of Revelation, and when you close it, no man can open it. So cause us to be faithful in taking advantage of every opportunity that you entrust to us, whether we are young or whether we are old. You give to each one of us opportunities, usually on a daily basis, to make our faith in Jesus Christ known, that others may hear and believe, and by your grace be saved. So Father, we commit this message to you. We pray that you will take your word and use it powerfully in the hearts of each one of us, to the glory of Jesus Christ, your Son, for we pray it in his name. Amen. It's a fascinating passage to close the book of Acts. And what an amazing last verse to this missionary book. Preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no man forbidding him. For two full years, the Apostle Paul had a free hand in Rome, the place where later Satan would make his seat. But God withheld Satan from hurting Paul in any way, and he opened the door of opportunity in the most unlikely of all places, the capital of the Roman Empire. Let's look at it, but first remember that the last time we were together, we studied the interrelationship of some of the key doctrines dealing with the choices of the sovereign God. And clearly here at the end of the book, that is what comes through loud and clear. First, we studied the seven principles of human accountability versus free will. And we learned that human accountability is not the same thing as so-called free will. A lot of people try to make those two things identical, the Arminians in particular, but human accountability is not the same thing as so-called free will. Number two, no created morally cognizant being, that is, those who have moral responsibility and they are aware of the fact that they have moral responsibility, no created morally cognizant being has truly free will, although we are all accountable to God for our actions, words, thoughts, motives, and attitudes. Number three, we learn that the only truly free will in the universe is the will of God. The only truth, truly free will in the universe is the will of God. Number four, only God's will is truly free because only God is omnipotent and capable of accomplishing with precision what he purposes to do. You and I can't do that. We may purpose something, we may head toward it, but because we're not omnipotent, we can't guarantee that we're going to get the results that we wanted to get. So only God's will is truly free because only God is omnipotent and capable of accomplishing with precision what he purposes to do, and only he can determine the end from the beginning without faith. That's very important. You and I can head toward the goal. We can look at what we want to achieve in the end, but we cannot always do it without fail. God is the only one who is truly free to do that. Number five, only God's will is truly free because only God is not morally accountable to any other being outside of himself. That's a very important point for us to remember. When people talk to you about free will, you need to remind them that only God's will is truly free because only God is not morally accountable to any other being outside of himself. We're not free because we are morally accountable to someone outside of ourselves. Number six, only God's will is truly free because only God can define what is right and what is wrong. The ability to define, to set the definition, is a powerful ability 
because it's the ability of freedom. You and I don't have the freedom to determine what is morally right. The United States Supreme Court tries to have the final authority, for example, in what constitutes a marriage. But they're not free to do that. They can pompously declare that a man and a man can get married, but they're not free to do that. They do it in rebellion. They don't do it in freedom. They do it in rebellion against the standards that God has established, the one who has the only truly free will, because only God can define what is right and wrong. He has no morally compelling boundaries outside of his own character. And seventh, finally we studied how human accountability ties into the doctrines of election and predestination. So that was the first major block. The second major block, we looked at the two great principles of how the term elect is used in the Bible. Number one, we saw that the term elect means not merely chosen, it means chosen to accomplish a specific purpose. And of course that's a divinely ordained purpose. It's chosen to accomplish a specific purpose. Election is not only related to the doctrine of salvation, it is related to the divine plan of God. We tend to think in terms of a human benefit. So we think, oh, election, that means salvation. But salvation is only one part of the divine plan of God. Ultimately, the divine plan of God involves bringing glory to himself through all that is and all that ever will be. The divine plan of God is comprehensive. The divine plan of God is down to the preciseness and finest and most minute details. So election is not merely related to the doctrine of salvation. It's related to the divine plan of God, whereby God accomplishes his goal with and for his moral creatures in every aspect of his universe. And the second great principle to deal with you with election is election is not merely a question of God making choices. It is, it's referring to the fact that God makes choices with the most intricate and intense purposes, and here's the key, for bringing eternal glory to himself, for he is worthy. So with those two basic underlying principles, it helped us to understand why elect and election are used in so many different ways in the Bible. In fact, we looked at 10 of them. That's the third point. We learned the 10 different ways that the term elect is used in the Bible. Jesus Christ is called the elect. National Israel is called the elect. Because see, we're having choices being made that have a purpose. And so God elects. He makes a choice for a specific purpose. And all the purposes for each of these is not the same, except for the ultimate purpose of bringing him glory. That's why Christ is called the elect. That's why national Israel is called the elect. That's why the Jews who will be saved in the tribulation are called the elect. That's the third of the ten points. Number four, believers in Christ are called the elect. Number five, the churches are called elect churches. Number six, we saw that the unfallen angels are called the elect angels. Number seven, we saw that the elect are no longer under the condemnation that falls on the non-elect. It's not a matter of, you know, you have to do something bad to... Uh, have, have condemnation, condemnation. Well, well, if you don't trust in Jesus Christ, Christ you're already under condemnation. condemnation. John, John chapter 3 makes that very clear. clear. Number, Number eight, eight, the elect, the elect have, have obligations, obligations as to how they will live. live. Just, being Just being among the elect does not mean that you are then free to live any way that you want to live. Number nine, God specifically appoints certain Christians to preach the gospel to the elect. God guarantees that all the elect will be saved. And he's going to guarantee that every one of the elect will hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Nobody gets saved apart from the gospel of Jesus Christ. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And if there was one elect in the dead center heart of China, or India, or Africa, or North Korea, and the devil threw everything in the way possible to keep them from hearing the gospel, God would keep them alive until he got somebody to them, either through the radio or television or a scrap of paper or a track or personally face to face, 
who shares with them the good news concerning Christ, who died for our sins according to the scriptures, and was buried and rose again the third day according to the scripture. None of the elect will be lost. That's a marvelous, wonderful guarantee that God has made when we speak of election. God specifically appoints certain Christians to preach the gospel to the elect. And number 10, we saw that election is tied to foreknowledge, but it is not tied to fatalism. There is a great deal of difference between foreknowledge and fatalism. A great deal of difference between election and fatalism. We learned that election is the result of divine choices, but fatalism is the result of random selection with no rational basis other than chance. When we talk about people being saved, that is not fatalism. When we talk about God's hand involved in it, that's not fatalism. Oh, well, I can't be saved anyway, so I guess, I guess it's just no good for me. No. Fatalism is based on chance, on the roll of the dice, on probability. But election is based on the result of divine choices. That brought us to the fourth area of our study, which led us to the study of the biblical knowledge of uh, doctrine of foreknowledge. And we learned two very important keys. There are a lot more, but we, the ones that we studied. The two important keys to foreknowledge. Number one, foreknowledge means that God knew all the possible scenarios, and he chose the exact and specific one that most perfectly glorifies him and all of his character attributes. Let's suppose that for any particular situation, in your life, there were one million possible scenarios. Scenario number one, you're going to die. That's a possibility. It could be for this particular second, you're going to die. Or, second possible scenario is your mind is going to wander. You're going to be alive, but your mind's going to wander. Third possible scenario is you feel hot, so you fan yourself with a bullet bullet. Next possible scenario, you smiled at what I just said. Some of you didn't. You see, there are so many possibilities for every second of your life. Not just the big decisions. Not just, will I marry this person or not marry this person. That's what we normally think in terms of big blocks of things that are going to happen and all the little things we hope will happen around that. Foreknowledge means that God saw every possibility for every atom of his creation, being positioned at an exact point in the universe, no farther and no closer than any other possible point. You think of just those things. That for all of his moral creatures, there are a zillions of possibilities of what could take place. You think even about the moment of your conception. And how many possibilities there were for a specific sperm to penetrate a specific egg released at a specific ovulation period, producing a different individual. Folks, there are an infinite number of possibilities. But God had a purpose. His purpose was ultimately, through all that transpires in all of creation, ultimately, he would receive the greatest amount of glory, and any change to it would mean that he received less glory than he will ultimately receive in all of eternity. That boggles the mind when you think about it. Foreknowledge deals with all the possibilities and the specific choices that God made, knowing how each choice would affect every other possible choice. It's like when you hit the billiard ball and it goes down, if it hits to the right of the cue, it does certain things with the other billiard balls and scattered different ways. If you hit slightly to the left, say a half inch to the left, it affects them in a different way. If you hit them square on, it hits a different way. If you hit them between them, it, hits, it goes a different way. You see, each action affects all the other actions. And God knew all the possibilities of how each thing would interact with every other thing that ever was or would be. He knew all the possibilities. And he said, this set of possibilities ultimately brings me the greatest possible amount of glory.
foreknowledge is very clearly tied to the sovereignty of God because God is not biting his nails wondering what's going to happen because God has determined by the way in which he created the universe what would happen. For example, you think about Adam and Eve. God could have created instead Adam and Eve and Mary or Steve and Adam and Jane. He didn't do that. He could have created Bork and Zog who didn't look anything like any of us. They could have been green with four knobs sticking out of the top of their head with eyeballs on top of each knob. He didn't. He created Adam and Eve because Adam and Eve would fall. And God could demonstrate his love and redemption in a way that could never be expressed without the fall. We don't like that because it goes against our human instinct. Of course, Adam and Eve had human instinct too and look where it got them. We serve a magnificent, majestic God who is in charge. And we are in rebellion. Foreknowledge, that was number one. God means that God knew all the possible scenarios and chose the exact and specific one that most perfectly glorifies him and all of his character attributes. Number two, the second major key that we learned the foreknowledge was foreknowledge does not mean that God looked down the quarters of time and saw what would happen and then made his choices on that basis. Oh, it looks like that's going to happen, so I'm going to say, uh, I therefore choose that this will happen. Oh, that's a that's pathetic a God, God if he has to do that. that. He, he can he see, see the future coming, coming but uh, just, uh, to just to make, make sure that everybody sure thinks he's in charge, charge he says, well, I see it's happening. happening. They don't know about it yet. Yeah. So I'll so say I'll it say in it advance, advance so they'll think I, I, I was I in was control. control. Foreknowledge does not mean that God looked down the quarters of time and saw what would happen and chose on that basis because that makes God subject to history rather than making history subject to God. The fourth error we studied was foreknowledge. Fifth, we studied the doctrine of predestination and how it is different from, although obviously related to, the doctrine of election. In particular, we studied how election fits together with predestination to form a comprehensive unit. Election and predestination are not identical or interchangeable terms, although they're obviously welded together to form a comprehensive view of God's sovereignty. And we learned four basic things about it. Number one, Election deals with God making choices among the morally accountable parts of his creation, that is men and angels, to accomplish a specific purpose determined by God alone. But in contrast to that, we learn that predestination deals with God determining in eternity past the ultimate destination of all of his morally accountable creatures, both men and angels. Election dealing more with the purposes of God once creation is here, and what he's going to do with each individual in time and space. Predestination is the determination of the end location, whether you're going to be in heaven or hell. Predestination, destination determined in advance. It deals with God determining in eternity past the ultimate destination of all of his morally accountable creatures, both men and angels. Number three. As with the doctrine of election, there are certain divine goals in view in the doctrine of predestination. Election has goals. Predestination has goals. Number four, ultimately predestination relates to salvation. Election doesn't always relate to salvation because Christ is called the elect. He's not getting saved, all right? But predestination, as applied to men and angels, ultimately relates to the doctrine of salvation. But within that context, there are other goals that God has planned for those to whom he has guaranteed heaven. That led us to the sixth major division of our study. That led us to study the subheadings under the doctrine of predestination. We saw this last week. First, the New Testament doctrine of adoption is related or tied to predestination. 
having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, not our will, his will. And we talked about what the adoption uh, means. We're children of God both by the new birth, John 3, and by legal adoption, whereby we are made co-heirs with Jesus Christ, and we discussed that in detail. Second, we saw that the New Testament doctrine of eternal inheritance is tied to predestination. That's in Ephesians 1, in whom we have obtained an inheritance being predestinated according to the purpose, that's one of his purposes, of him who works all things after the counsel of his own will. We see the sovereign will of God at work in each one of these different subheadings under predestination. That's obviously also connected to the doctrine of adoption because it's legal heirs who receive the inheritance in an estate. The third thing that we saw as a subheading under predestination, we studied how the term chosen is tied to predestination because the term chosen is also used to express predestination, that is, the ultimate destiny of men, angels, and nations, determined and guaranteed by God from eternity past. We saw, number one, the term chosen is used of God's earthly people, the Jews. And we looked at passages in Deuteronomy and even in the book of Mark where it talks about a God choosing the Jews for specific purposes. We saw the term chosen is used for the earthly Jerusalem, the capital of God's earthly people, the Jews, and the place that God has chosen for Jesus Christ to reign during the millennial kingdom. We saw the term chosen is used of God's sovereign choice in predestination to salvation. That's the one that you've heard me preach on before. Perhaps the most striking verses concerning predestination and salvation are these. 2 Thessalonians 2.13 But we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation. And then he explains the means whereby he accomplishes it. Through sanctification of the Spirit, that means you set apart by the Spirit and believe in the truth. God is the one who gives you faith. We've seen that already and we've studied that many times. We saw in Matthew 22, 14, many are called, but few are chosen. Matthew 20, 16, so the last shall be first, and the first last, for many be called, but few chosen. And John 15, verse 19, if you are of the world, the world would love his own, but because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Ephesians 1, 4, according as he hath chosen us in him, that is in Christ, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love having predestinated us, and so on, in verse 5. We saw that the term chosen is also used to speak of the doctrine of reprobation, those who are chosen to damnation. Jesus answered them, Have I not chosen you twelve? And one of you is a devil. We find in 1 Peter 2, 18, And a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, and what a powerful last phrase, whereunto also... They were appointed. They stumbled at the word because they were appointed. They stumbled at the word. They are disobedient because they were appointed to be disobedient. Powerful doctrine, one that is not often preached, but the doctrine of reprobation. The term chosen is also used in dealing with predestination as it refers to Christ. Quoting Isaiah, it says, Behold, this is Matthew 12, Behold my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved in whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him, and he will show judgment to the Gentiles. 1 Peter 2, 4, To whom coming as unto a living stone, speaking of coming to Christ, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. The seventh major area of our study was when we studied the various purposes that God had in predestination, including predestination guaranteeing that we will bear the fruit of the Spirit. Predestination guaranteeing the giving and exercise of the gifts of the Spirit. Predestination providing empowerment and clarity for specific positions of spiritual service. Predestination guaranteeing that God will give us the service qualifications that He requires of us. He never asks you to do something that He doesn't empower you to do. Did you know that? You say, yeah, I know the Bible says that I'm supposed to witness, but you know, I'm not very good at it. You remember anybody who said, I can't do it because I Moses, you're right. And, and what, what did God, God say to 
to Moses. Moses, who made your tongue? When you're telling God, it's impossible for you to do what he commands you to do, you're doing two things. You're number one, calling God a liar. And number two, you're calling God incompetent. Because God delights to use the weak nobodies of the world. So he can prove that the people who think they are big stuff are really nothing. Never tell God that you can't obey because you're not able. Because if God gives you a command, he always, not sometimes, he always gives you the power and the ability to obey his command. You can't ever say like one of the comedians a number of years ago, I think one who's recently been on trial, said, well, the devil made me do it. And everybody laughed. No, the devil didn't make you do it if you're a believer. The devil throws out the temptation. He's hoping that you will decide not to take God's power and that you'll choose to walk in the flesh instead. And he makes some very, very seductive temptations in all areas of life. But the devil didn't make you do it. God has given you his indwelling Holy Spirit, who is more powerful than all the demons and the devil put together. He has given you his word, whereby you know what you are supposed to do and what you are supposed to not do. God has made provision so that you can, in fact, obey. Most of us simply don't like to obey. We like to do it ourselves. We don't want to do it God's way. We want to do it our way because we see what we think will reach the purposes that we want to reach, but that may not be the purpose that God wants you to reach. You can be in rebellion without having, quote, free will because you can't reach the purposes you want to reach, which are usually sinful if they're contrary to Scripture. So predestination provides empowerment and clarity for specific positions of spiritual service. Predestination, we saw, guarantees that God will give us the service qualifications that he requires of us. He's promised to put all the necessary spiritual gifts in each body of believers. We saw that when we studied all these spiritual gifts. 21 different spiritual gifts. Seven of those were temporary gifts, only given during the apostolic period. And we look at the ones that we look at as the supernatural gifts, we said, yeah, yeah, God clearly had to give that gift. Um, you know, like gift of apostle and prophet and healings and miracles and tongues and interpretation of tongues and the gift of knowledge, which is a reception of new special revelation, things that God had never revealed before. But then we sort of think that we can fulfill all the other ones on our own, like the gift of pastor, teacher, and evangelist, and teacher, and helps, and governments, and all these other things that we think of as like the little Mickey Mouse kind of gifts. No. God specifically gifts you and he places you in a specific body so that you can exercise the gift that he gave you. That is one of the subheadings that is guaranteed by predestination. Predestination guarantees also that all new special revelation would be given. God didn't miss a beat when he gave us the New Testament. It wasn't at some point where Paul was out of fellowship and so Paul missed some revelation that he should have written down. He missed one church to whom he should have written a book and therefore we don't have God's complete revelation. God guaranteed through predestination all new special revelation would be given. But that also means something else. That all new special revelation which he designed for the body of Christ through this entire period would be preserved. God has done that. That's why there is such a great fight today over the underlying texts behind, for example, the King James Version on one side, which uses the Textus Receptus, the received text, and all the other versions on the other side, 
which is called the eclectic text or the West Cotton Port text, whereby whole verses and parts of verses are left out. Now, either God preserved his word in the original languages, or he did not. Predestination covers the issue both of inspiration, not just revelation, but inspiration, and preservation, and illumination, so that God's people would not only read, but would understand in a progress of spiritual growth. That's important for us, because otherwise, how do we know we've got everything that God wanted us to know? If we don't have the whole Bible, I mean, yeah, what if God let a couple of books get lost? What if God really did leave out those verses that are left out, uh, you know, like from Mark 16 on? You know, that's, there's some, some real problems with that. How about all the verses that are left out that deal with the deity of Christ? How about all the verses that are left out that, that deal with moral purity? For example, the pericope about the woman taken in adultery. Last verse of John chapter 7 to verse 11 of chapter 8 uh, are left out of the West Cotsworth text. God's predestining purposes guarantee that the special revelation which he gave and which was written down would be given and preserved. We saw, we saw that predestination, the predestination guarantees ultimate victory in the spiritual warfare. Second Timothy 2 Timothy 2.4 No man that warreth entangleth himself with affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath... Here's our word. What is it? Who hath... Chosen. That's right. Chosen him to be a soldier. Everybody who's a believer is in the army. Whether you like it or not, You've been chosen to be a soldier because you are going to fight spiritual battles. You don't have any choice about that. The devil will attack you. The demons will attack you. The world will attack you. The flesh will attack you. You are in a battle and God has chosen you to be a soldier. And if he has chosen you, he has equipped you. And that's what Ephesians chapter 6 verses 10 through the end of the chapter is all about. And your goal is to please the one who conscripted you into the military. We saw that predestination shows the contrast between what people value versus what God values. I love these verses because it means I have hope and so do you. We saw in James chapter 2 verse 5, Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom which he hath promised to them that love him? God makes choices on a different basis than people make choices. God chose the people who are the poor of this world. The scripture explains to us, don't the rich people oppress you? Yeah. It's the rich people who want to control things. because They think they want to control things because they got money. And so they can bend things the way they want it to be bent. Because they got the money to do it. Or they got the position. Or they got the power. Or they've got whatever they think they've got. God has chosen the poor of this world because they're rich in something else. They have to be. They can't but repent on their money. Rich in faith. And heirs of the kingdom which he has promised to them to love him. I mentioned it just a few minutes ago, but Paul gives us an extended passage dealing with that principle in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning in verse 25. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, the weakness of God is stronger than man, for ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. Verse 27. Look around you. Not many wise, not many mighty, not many noble. We don't have any princes in here. Uh, we don't have any congressmen in here. Or senators or representatives. Uh, we certainly don't have the President of the United States here. We don't have any members of the Supreme Court here. We don't have a governor, lieutenant governor. We don't have any state senators or representatives. We don't have any county commissioners. We don't have any borough officials. Um, maybe some of them go somewhere. Paul makes that point. You see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh. I think we have any college professors in here. Not many mighty. I don't think there's anybody in here who's an Olympic athlete. 
Not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. They can't get it. They don't understand it. What? You mean that guy is saved? You mean God's going to take him to heaven? He's got no brains. God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. You mean God chose that cripple and didn't choose me when I set the world record uh, in a marathon? And the base things of the world and the things which are despised hath God chosen. You mean that leper in India scraping his sores into the Ganges River? God chosen, and he's saved. He is really, really gross. The base things, the things which are despised, have God chosen. Yea, and the things which are not. You look around, you don't even see the guy. To bring to naught, that is to bring to nothing, things that are. And God had a specific purpose in it. See, predestination has purposes because it shows the contrast between what people value and what God values. Here is God's purpose, verse 29. That no flesh should glory in his presence. Everybody who gets saved has to come to the foot of the cross. Everybody that gets saved has to understand that they are a miserable, wretched, filthy, stinking, vile sinner. That they don't deserve the goodness of God. And they come on the basis not of the works, not of the law. They come on the basis of the grace of God and by faith in what he's promised. And finally, we saw the predestination guarantees our ultimate victory with Christ. In Revelation 17, the last verse we looked at last week was verse 14. These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them, for he is the Lord of lords and King of kings. And they that are with him are called and chosen, and faithful. Magnificent promises concerning predestination. That brings us to the section we want to look at quickly tonight, verses 25 and following. When they agreed not among themselves, they departed after that Paul had spoken one word. Well spake the Holy Ghost by Isaiah the prophet unto our fathers, saying, Go unto this people and say, Hearing ye shall hear, and ye shall not understand. Seeing ye shall see, and not perceive. For the heart of this people is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing. And their eyes they have closed, that they should hear, see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. Be it known therefore unto you that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles. How we praise God for that. And that they will hear it. And when he had said these words, the Jews departed and had great reasoning among themselves. And Paul dwelt two whole years in his own hired house and received all that came in unto him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things which concerned the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no man forbidding him. I'm going to go through this quickly. We've only got six minutes. The first obvious thing in the passage that we just read here is again the sovereignty of God in at least three ways. Three things are told us in those verses, which we haven't studied yet. Three things are told us about the sovereignty of God in those verses. Number one is God plants the seeds. The Jews left, but the seed had been planted and God would cause it to take root in his timing. The seed had been planted, even though the Jews left. God got the seed planted and he caused it to take root in his timing. We see that in the later verses because people kept coming back. Second, God was sovereign in the passage because Paul had two full years of ministry before he was brought to trial. He could have gotten one of those situations whereby, okay, you're in Rome, your trial is next week. God gave him two full years. And the third thing, which is astounding, he had never experienced this in all the rest of his ministry. There were no restrictions on his ministry. He's there in Rome. No restrictions. And he doesn't have to travel around. God was bringing people to him. The sovereignty of God shown in the fact that the seed was planted and would take root. That Paul had two full years of ministry before he was brought to trial. Number three, that there were no restrictions in his ministry. The second obvious thing in the passage is the prophetic precision. 
The first thing that we saw was the sovereignty of God. Now we see the prophetic precision of the Old Testament in at least three ways. Number one, God had prophesied, and it was happening, that Israel would come under judgmental blindness. Now Isaiah prophesied that more than 800 years before it took place. So the precision of prophecy. Israel would come under judgmental blindness and deafness for rejecting the Messiah. Number two, Judgmental blindness would mean a generally closed door of salvation. Although we see throughout the book of Acts that it was not completely closed. Some of them believed, some of them did not. He was preaching to the Jews. He called for the Jews. Some of them believed, some of them did not. That was what we studied as we were going through all those doctrines of election, predestination, foreknowledge, and the sovereignty of God. But it was a generally closed door of salvation for Israel, national Israel, the Jews, during the church age. Number three, God had promised, and now God was fulfilling the opening of the door for Gentiles to be saved in great numbers. That have been prophesied in the Old Testament. A light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of my people Israel. That was promised about the Messiah. Now we see it being fulfilled. And Paul states that, and he says, God's opened the door for the Gentiles to be saved, and they were saved, and as you know, over the last 2,000 years, have been saved in great numbers. First thing, sovereignty of God in the passage. Second thing in the passage, prophetic precision of the Old Testament prophecies. The third thing, obvious, in the passage is the unsettling impact that the gospel has on those who hear it. And the incredibly different responses. Same message, different responses. Here it caused a great debate. And you know something? That was a debate among those who had come seeking. They came to the Apostle Paul. He called them and they came and they said, we really want to hear what you have to say. They were seeking. They wanted to know. They hadn't heard anything bad. So there was no preconceived notion one way or the other. But they said, we know that there's a, a big stir about this new sect. Tell us about it. They all came looking. But when they went away, there was a great debate. And that was among those who not only came seeking, but those are people who had a basic knowledge of the scriptures. Those were the Jews who came that Paul had contacted and said, I want to tell you about this. Because I want to tell you that there's no reason for me being here. Well, no human reason. God had a reason. God had told Paul that he was going to preach before emperors. God had already told the Apostle Paul that he was going to go to Rome. Even on board ship, the angel of the Lord stood by Paul and said, Look, everybody's going to live through this because I have a purpose in it. I'm going to get you to Rome. God fulfilled his plan. And now we see that there's a different response. You know, when you share the gospel of Christ, you can share it with a group of co-workers. And they can all be interested at first, and some will accept it, and some won't. I do hope you share Christ with your co-workers. If you don't, you have a problem. You say, but what will they think? What will the boss say? What will... The question is, what will God say? When you stand before the Lord Jesus Christ, and He brings your life before you, and He can do it in a split second, whereby it all spreads out, whereby you know everything that you did, said, thought, all your motives and all your attitudes, and half of them over on this side and half on this side, well, no, maybe more than half on one side and only a few things on the other. And he says, why didn't you tell that person about me? I thought I'd lose my job. I thought I'd lose a customer. I was embarrassed. I didn't really know what to say. Oh, you mean you didn't study my word on that subject? Do you remember on such and such a morning when you were having devotions and you decided to let your mind wander and you glanced over the verse that would have answered that person's question, but you were paying attention to some of your own folly in your head? People, we, me included, will stand before Jesus Christ someday and give a full, not a partial, 
a full account for the things done in this body. Exact words of scripture. Exact words for believers. We're forgiven what we give in account. And we lose rewards. And there will be tears in heaven. We'll study that when we get to the book of Revelation. Those are serious issues. That was the third obvious thing. The gospel has an unsettling impact on those who hear it. The fourth obvious thing for which we have the title of this message, Government Supported Ministry, is that Paul didn't have to worry about his expenses. Did you pick that up? Rome always paid to take care of its prisoners. In Paul's case, everyone connected to him knew that he was innocent of the charges brought against him. I mean, you start all the way back in his trial before Felix and Festus and Agrippa, and everybody said, you know, what are we going to say? I mean, the centurion didn't know what to do other than just send him out of the, out of the city of Jerusalem. There were no charges! Everybody knew he was innocent on board the ship. The centurion on board the ship found that out. The soldiers found that out. The sailors found that out. The captain found that out. They suddenly understood that Paul is serving a living God who can save you through the worst storm that has ever hit the Mediterranean Sea. The people on the island found that out as Paul healed the father of Publius. Everybody knew that Paul was innocent. Rome paid to take care of his expenses. And so Paul had a rental house. Nobody else got that. The whole the rest of them went down to the prison. Paul obviously had plenty of food and water during his house arrest. And he had at least one captive audience at all times. The soldier who was taking care of him. And, you know, I suspect there was more than one soldier because one soldier wouldn't want to be with him 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They probably ran in shifts. Maybe there were three different guys. Maybe there were 21 different guys. Each one took a shift sometime during the week for eight hours. The Apostle Paul had a captive audience. Do you think the Apostle Paul, you know, and thought, ah, he's a Roman, he's a soldier. He's not even listening to me. God had already brought Roman soldiers into the body. Cornelius, Acts chapter 10 and all of the household of Cornelius. Do you think that those soldiers, when they went home at night, talked to their wives and children about the weird prisoners they had? How this guy, who obviously hadn't done anything wrong, was sitting there and telling them the most amazing things about God that they had ever heard. They grew up in a pantheistic society, a polytheistic society. They grew up in a society whereby they were worshiping all kinds of planets and gods who did all kinds of horrible things. And suddenly here's a guy who's telling them about a God who is holy and righteous and yet a God of love. A God who will judge sin, but a God who forgives. Do you think that God had sovereignly planned which soldiers would be with the Apostle Paul as he was under house arrest? Yes, I think so. I suspect that we may see some of them in heaven. We don't know their names. But, but the Apostle Paul had a captive audience. He wasn't just captive. They were captive. They couldn't do anything else except what their, their general told them to do. They had to go and take care of this prisoner. Some of them may have complained and said, oh, we have to listen to that guy all day long. You really mean we've got to go and sit there again? Others said, I am so glad that you put me with him. I have learned so much. It is the most wonderful assignment you have ever given to me. We saw different different responses responses with the Jews. I suspect there were different responses responses with the soldiers who had to keep the Apostle Apostle Paul. The fifth fifth obvious obvious thing thing that we we see out of this passage passage is that God God gave Paul security security and protection protection while he proclaimed the gospel for two full years. years. Now that's that's different than all the rest of the book of Acts. Acts. We get to the end of the book of Acts and suddenly we find a complete shift in what Paul experiences. He may be under arrest, but I suspect that he thought of it more as a time of (laughs) R&R. He doesn't have to worry about people attacking him. 
because he's got a bodyguard. He's got a Roman soldier. He's at the capital where this huge, massive Roman army is. Anybody who tried to hurt the Apostle Paul there was in serious trouble. He was under the protection of Rome. And he had a personal bodyguard who was skilled in warfare. There weren't many assassins that came in close to the Apostle Paul there. They all had to be vetted first. Paul says, soldier, yeah, let those guys in. Want to talk to them about the gospel. He could receive anybody that he wanted to receive during that period of time. You know, it's rather interesting as we think about that. That would have been a pleasant change after so many missionary journeys where he was hunted like an animal, where he was starved, where he was shipwrecked, where he was beaten, where he was stoned, where he was abused both by his enemies and by the Jews and under continual attack by Satan and his demons. Paul didn't have any of that problem while he was there in Rome. And he didn't have that problem because the Roman government was paying his way. Number six, the sixth obvious thing that is that God is free to change the course of a man's ministry as he gets older to the benefit of his chosen servant and to give him success where before he had to fight painful battles. Rather interesting. As you consider all the different ministries all over the world, how God oftentimes suddenly and very unexpectedly changes a man's ministry. We have Brother Ken Olson with us this morning. And God unexpectedly changed his ministry. Where now he's no longer down in Brazil, but he's going to be in the States and going to be able to minister back in Cameroon, where he was before, and go back on occasion to Brazil and have ministry among churches here in the States. God is perfectly free to change a man's ministry at any point because he also chooses to benefit the servants who have served him faithfully and who love him. And he can give them success where before they had painful battles. You know, it's interesting. Nobody did anything to try to stop Paul while he was preaching in Rome. Now, you know, the devil later hated the ministry that Paul had and which he left there in Rome, so much so that the devil raised up the Roman Catholic institution. But when Paul was there, God prevented all the bad things that Paul had to endure, and God opened the door for gospel witness. The seventh and final thing that we see here in this passage is that Paul spent a good deal of time talking about two things. He talked about those two things to the Jews earlier in the passage. We see him mentioning both those things when he talked to them about them. And then he continued to talk about the same two things, which should give us an idea of what we ought to be talking about. It First of all, it says he spoke about the kingdom of God. What's the kingdom of God like? You know, as you study that phrase through Scripture, you discover that deals with the things that believers are supposed to be like and what they're supposed to be doing. The kingdom of God. How's it organized? Who's in it? What do they do? What do they believe? That's believers. He talked about the kingdom of God. You see, some people came to Christ. So he's building them in their faith. He's teaching them, exhorting them, encouraging them comforting them, instructing them. And the second thing he did was preach the gospel. It says, and he spoke about the things that deal with the Lord Jesus. People who didn't know who Jesus Christ was, he told them about that. He preached the gospel. In other words, even during his house arrest, he had a ministry both to the saved and a ministry to the lost. That's how the book of Acts ends. The church history records for us Paul's martyrdom. The book of Acts doesn't end with Paul's martyrdom. The book of Acts ends with what we are all supposed to be doing. We're supposed to have a ministry to those who are saved. We're supposed to have a ministry to those who are lost. It ends on a positive note. Because, see, for the believer, regardless of how we end our physical life, there's joy and gladness in serving Jesus. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you once again for your word and for its power. 
through the things that you've entrusted to us as we have studied this book. You've told us about how the church began. You've told us how it grew, how it expanded first from Jewish men to Samaritans who are half Jewish and half Gentile, and it talks about both men and women, to those who were neither men nor women, the Ethiopian eunuch in chapter 8, to those who were Gentiles, and not just Gentiles, but those of the oppressing nation, the Romans, where we find an entire family mentioned, men, women, and children. The spread of the gospel from the center point, Jerusalem, to Judea, to Samaria, and as we look at the missionary journeys in the book of Acts, to the uttermost parts of the earth, we find the message that was proclaimed. We find the response both concerning those who believed and those who did not believe. We saw the opposition to remind us that ours is not an easy commission, though you have given it to us. And if you give us a commission, you will give us the empowerment to fulfill the commission. We can obey, and as we obey, you give us our greatest blessing, even if it's not what we think we want. You demonstrated yourself strong on behalf of Peter and Paul and James and the others who are mentioned in the book of Acts. We pray, Father, that that will have taught us how we as believers are supposed to live. And that when you choose, you can give us, as you did with Paul, though in an unexpected circumstance, freedom in ministry without the pressure that we've always felt before. We thank you, Father, for giving us the book of Acts, that we might learn what it is to be a Christian, how we are to live, and the joy that is set before us. Because we look to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For we consider him, who endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest we be wearied and faint in our minds. For we have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. Father, we pray that you will make us faithful, for it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. And at the end, those who are with the Lord Jesus Christ, as we've read in Revelation 17, are chosen and called and faithful. Even so make us, O Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.